Um, well, let me just share with you that it is um, definitely <clears throat> a privilege to be here. I would have never dreamed um, in all my years <laughs> that um, God would uh, arrange for this. And he's done some pretty amazing things uh, since I gave my life back over to him. Um, most importantly, wherever you are coming from on this topic, I want you to know that um, I'm not here to shove what I think down your throat. <laughs> I'm just here to share with you what God has done for me, um, what I have found in developing a relationship with him and seeking to do his will instead of my own. Um, through my own study of the Bible and what it's revealed to me and how I can go about um, sharing that with others today. <clears throat> this topic um, has lived in silence um, for the 150 years um, of the denomination um, of, of this church. And today, I am blessed to be able to break that silence. Because it is a topic that... Um, we haven't um, talked about, and, and largely uh, in most Christian faiths, it, it's pretty quiet, pretty silent. Um, guess who thinks that they have um, a corner on, an, on anchoring um, uh, ownership of that? Um, but, but Satan, um, because we don't talk about homosexuality, we don't talk about pornography, we don't talk about masturbation, we don't talk about any kind of sexual impurity. And so why wouldn't he be thrilled to death, uh, literally at one point in time here, um, to keep this silent? Uh, but today, my ministry colleagues and I are sharing our own individual um, testimonies about what God has done in our lives. And we are beginning to find that, there, that this is reaching a number of people um, who have been waiting for this kind of help and the kind of healing that Jesus Christ offers. Before I go any further, because of the nature of this topic, and of course we would always want to invite um, Jesus um, to be with us, but I find that wherever I go, um, there's uh, usually something technologically or otherwise um, that the enemy tries to start to mess with, and if not even people's minds and hearts, and uh, as much as we try not to have judgment, um, a lot of people come with certain preconceived ideas, um, thinking it's going to be this, that, or the other. And I just want to say that this is a message of love, um, that there is nothing that any of us can do um, for Jesus Christ if it is not motivated from his love and recognizing how that love can change our lives. So um, I invite you to bow your heads with me this morning. Heavenly Father, I just ask for your presence here this morning. I ask that you will come into the hearts and the minds of those sitting here. Lord, this is something that we don't talk about. It's unfamiliar. Uh, some people may laugh. They may giggle. They may be angry. There may be all kinds of emotions going through their minds. And so I ask for your blood to cover this building, your church, and everyone who is in it. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that Satan and his angels would be sent to the very foot of the cross where they have absolutely no power whatsoever. I pray that, Lord, hearts and minds and ears would listen today and that everyone would walk away with something that would bring them a sense of comfort, a sense of knowing your presence and all that is possible through you. And I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm putting into <clears throat> one hour here what I typically would put into <clears throat> over the course of three presentations. Um, but if you want the more in depth version of this, um, come to the Island Church this afternoon. I shared my testimony there last night. Um, give a little sense of credibility uh, about where I'm coming from so that you'd know that I'd have reason to talk about this. And we will begin to unwrap uh, some of the things uh, in the 215 presentation called Engage. What do we do as a church? 
How do we reach out to the gay community? Is it possible to share something we don't have? And so we'll look at that. And at 3.30, so I'm with Christ today. I'm back in his family. Who am I? Am I a gay Christian? Am I a gay Adventist? Am I a homosexually oriented Christian? Am I a same-sex attracted Christian? And the list goes on and on, all having to do with sex. What kind of Christian am I? Or do I have a different identity that God has given me? So I invite you to come, uh, if you would like to, this afternoon to hear a little bit about that. And then right after that presentation will be an extended uh, Q&A, um, uh, which can often go um, uh, quite lengthy. I, you, you don't have to stay, but um, I will answer questions as long as people are asking them. Um, and I don't have all the answers, but I just have a bit of experience, which I'm happy to share with you. And I do know someone who does have the answers, and I will always point towards um, Jesus Christ. For those of you who did not hear my full testimony last night, I'm going to share with you this morning um, a video that's been put together um, as a uh, um, ministry promo. Um, it's really used um, to help churches and uh, organizations um, get in a nutshell what this is about, showing you uh, my life from birth until conversion. And so we might want to kill these lights here again, and I will um, play that for you. Here. I'm Wayne Blakely, and this is my story. Are you having a boy or a girl? I'm having a girl. There's no way I'm having a boy. It's a beautiful little boy. I didn't want a boy. Get him out of here. Go. What? Get out. Get him out of here now. Go. Get him out. <laughs> you can't come in with me. You're not a girl. What happened? He fell down. Has he fallen before? No. Hey, sis. Yeah, it's true. Jan isn't a fit mother. Well, as you know, I'm on assignment. I can't do anything about it. Well, you're my sister, and I want you to take Wayne and raise him as your own, because you know Jesus. All right. All right, cool. All right, thanks. I don't want to be a boy. I want to be a girl. Expect. Well, you found me in the personals. It's a sensual massage. I practice safe sex. Seattle Police, you're under arrest for prostitution. What's your real name? Wayne Blakely. Okay, Wayne, come with me. Get in the car, we're gonna go down to the station. Thanks for calling. <laughs> this sure beats being in the slammer. Yeah, man, I missed you. I wondered where you went. Yeah, it's good to be loud and proud again. Sorry to hear about Steve. When is his funeral? This Tuesday. Seems like every guy I know is dying from AIDS. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean.
I was standing in front of the mirror one day and realizing that I've lost the majority of my friends to AIDS and I want to memorialize them by having a heart um, on, my, on my arm and I want a survivor down the middle of it because I remain HIV negative and I'm the lucky one. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind. I wonder if the Adventist church has actually come up with an outreach to gays and homosexuals. Wow. Here's four interesting options. Christ is the only way any of us will be saved. He is willing and able to walk with us every step of the way. Wow. God, this is a lot of information. I don't know exactly what you want me to do. Pray with me that he'll give his heart to the Lord. And so we did. We had a special prayer together. And this was on Sabbath uh, between church and Sabbath school. Dear God, I don't know what to do. You know my life. You know everything I've done, you know, everywhere I've been, and, and I'm, I'm amazed that I'm still alive. I should have been dead many times, but somehow, for some reason, you have hung on to me. I don't want this to just be some haphazard thing. I, I want to love you. I want to know you. I don't know how to live my life right, but I, I know that you promised to empower me and show me, so Lord, please reveal yourself to me. So help me, God. Please do with me what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. The whole family were praying that week for you, too. Wayne called and said, I'm going to be baptized. My parents' prayers for nearly 40 years brought me out of darkness into light. I made a lot of poor choices in this city that ruined a lot of lives. But God preserved me and is using me today to testify of his redeeming love. <clears throat> All right, sure. <clears throat> so there you have it very um, briefly. What I will do um, now is tell you a, a little bit more detail uh, for starters. Um, my natural mother carried me full term over the nine months that she was pregnant, and relatives would come up to her and say, so are you having a boy or a girl? And she was adamant that she would have um, a girl and nothing but a girl. And in those days, um, there was no amniocentesis, there was no ultrasound. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> and so she couldn't force with her feelings my gender. And when I arrived, I wasn't some gift she could just simply put back or give back. We lived on an Air Force base. My father was an Air Force career man. He was gone on assignment most the majority of the time. <clears throat> the neighbors began to tell him that um, they believed that I was being abused. And he thought they were just being nosy neighbors and told them just stay out of his business until he came home from assignment one day uh, when I was two years old and found that my arm was in a cast. It was then that he decided that um, he should reach out to his sisters <clears throat> and to his brother and said, is there somebody who can help me here? And so uh, my aunt Virginia, my uncle Fred said, yes, we'll take Wayne for a while. And they took me and it wasn't long before um, my aunt had a nervous breakdown because I had a terrible temper tantrum. Um, is it any wonder that um, on the prenatal influence and the postnatal abuse 
that I wasn't running to the arms of a woman and saying, I love you. And yet I was trying desperately, even at that young age, um, to be what my natural mother would accept, and that would be a little girl. They passed me around in between aunts and uncles for a few more months, and I kept giving every aunt a nervous breakdown. And so my dad says, well, let's try, let's return him back to, to his natural mother. Maybe it was just a phase she was going through. And so they placed me back into her care, and then the state got involved and said, remove Wayne within 30 days or we will. And my father thought, I don't know what to do. I'm a career Air Forceman. I can't raise Wayne by myself, so I'm going to reach out again to my sisters and my brother. And my Aunt Virginia and my Uncle Fred said, you know, we've been praying about this. And we will take Wayne only if you allow us to permanently adopt him because we don't want him... Uh, continually passed around. So they took me and my father told me from, um, I, and I refer to my aunt and my uncle from this point forward um, as my parents because at two years old that's all I would know is that they were the people that were in charge and they were definitely my parents. My dad told me that uh, when he prayed this prayer and when he was convicted that they should adopt me, that God impressed him that he had a very, very special plan for me, for my life. I don't think this is the plan that my dad was thinking of. Because it's not easy to go and stand in front of people and to be transparent and to tell you all about my life as a gay man and my relationship with the church and what happened because of that. But it is God's special plan. It is what God laid on my heart when I gave my life back over to him. My father took me to the hospital to, to have that arm x-rayed, and it was broken in two places. Before I was three years old, I was running around the house screaming, I don't want to be a boy, I want to be a girl. Again, I was only trying to be what my natural mother would have accepted. You see, I arrived just like the rest of us, immediately wanting something. And if you don't go away with anything else today, go away with this. You matter, you belong, and you are loved. Jesus loves you. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. But you see, the enemy has a presence, a very strong presence in this world. And it is that presence that will continually nag at our flesh. And so I was believing the very first lie that he introduced to me. And that was the, the lie that I am unwanted. From my very first day of school until the very last, I was teased, harassed, and bullied. I made up my mind that if I could make it through 12 years of school, I would never step foot inside another classroom. And I haven't. Do you see already how I'm positioned there that with the same sex attracted feelings that began to, for me to experience, that I would see justification in being gay? I entered into high school in a private Christian school 
And the teasing and the harassment continued, um, even encouraged by some of the teachers, most notably my Bible teacher. My parents were trying to figure out what was going on in my life and what they could do um, to bring me some kind of help. And they reached out to teachers and to pastors and to psychologists, and nobody had any answers. In my freshman year of high school, um, there was a, a group on campus called Adventist Youth Association, and we had this separate little um, campus, a little house that we could go into, and it had um, uh, teenagers that were on fire for Christ and the youth pastor who was there, and it was kind of a safe haven for me. Nobody judged me. And, and for the first time, I found that there, there were guys there. There was a guy in particular that was nice to me. Um, he cared about me. He didn't make any judgments on me. And my response to that was, of course, from the standpoint that somebody was nurturing me and it felt protective, and I was appreciative. And so I started writing letters of appreciation for that friendship. And then they began to sound much like a love uh, note that a, that a guy would give to a girl that he had a crush on. I would offer him gifts. I would want to go and be alone on long walks or drives um, together in an isolated place where nobody else could get to that relationship um, because I felt so protected and cared about. I was experiencing um, the, the freedom that comes in not being judged. but it was heavily influenced with same-sex attraction. Oh, I tried to date. <laughs> but I would go on a date, and, and I wouldn't even necessarily want to hold hands, and, and I wasn't... The idea of, of giving a girl a kiss to me was, was a revolting thought. Now, don't get me wrong, I thought that women were absolutely gorgeous, beautiful. And I had a lot of creative instincts in me. But I didn't have the tingly thing going on. I didn't have the chemical reaction that, that was supposed to be there. That, that is shown that through the word of God that would be that perfect relationship between a man and a woman. It didn't exist for me. I was damaged goods. I made it through high school, and then I made up my mind that I wanted to leave home. I wanted to go explore freedom. I wanted to get away from people that, that were uh, making me uncomfortable and placing judgments on my life. And um, I began to work at um, Loma Linda University Hospital um, in California, big Adventist campus. Uh, big medical facility, and I worked as a, a unit secretary there. And there was a, um, an orderly that would come by my desk all the time when he was working on the unit where I was, and he was very flamboyant, and uh, he would make me laugh, and he came to me and he said, uh, Wayne, you need to call my roommate. And I said, why would I call your roommate? And he says, just call him. So I picked up the phone and I called him. His name was Glenn. I got on the phone with Glenn. And I wasn't on the phone for probably more than two minutes before he said, oh, you're gay. And I said, I'm what? Yeah, the term was just being developed that far back. He says, you like guys, don't you? I said, yeah, I think so. He said, why don't you come over after work and talk to me? So I went over. He was a very sensitive, caring individual. I felt comfortable, didn't feel judged. 
We talked for a little bit. And then he said this. Wayne, Adventism breeds homosexuality. What? What? Where do you come off saying that? Well, look, he says, you're gay, I'm gay. I'm going to La Sierra College. I've got classmates that are gay. Well, he said, Wayne, the church is really good at pointing out to us. It says in the Bible, it talks about homosexual behavior as being sin. And that's where it stops. Nobody says anything. Nobody tells you about how to find redemption from sin or what to do with your feelings of same-sex attraction. Just everybody is quiet and says nothing. But they whisper and they point. And they make it clear that you have a problem. And so what happens to bacteria when you leave it in the dark? It grows and grows and grows, as does all the other sexual impurity issues that we're not talking about, pornography, masturbation, adultery, swinging. He said, know what, Glenn? You're right. I'm out of here. I'm done with the church. I'm done with God. I'm gay. And I left the church. And Glenn took me to my first gay bar. And I walked in. And every single man in that bar had their eyes on me. And they were smiling. And they were motioning. I turned around, I looked at Glenn, I said, all these men are gay? Yeah. I thought I was in heaven. Why wouldn't I? I'd been scorned, I'd been alienated, I'd been rejected, I'd been teased, I'd been harassed, I'd been beat up. mentally and physically, largely by my own church. Why wouldn't the open arms of the gay community look inviting to me? Now, the enemy had a whole different thing going on, making it look that way, right? Because what was really going through those guys' minds were they wanted to have a sexual encounter with me. And so it wasn't really about true, genuine love. But it was very inviting because they were not afraid to touch me. They were not afraid to make me feel welcome. But they had another agenda that I wasn't particularly aware of right off the bat. But like minds gather together and you begin to feel comfortable in environments where people who also had been alienated by society and by their churches and by their families, and then now they've grouped together and there's power in numbers. But you isolate any one of them like me, and you begin to peel away the onion and you find a broken heart. Jesus is in the business of healing broken hearts. Eventually I moved to San Francisco and I fell in love with the first guy that I had ever fallen in love with like that before. He um, also didn't put any judgment on me, made lots of compliments about me and acted like he liked me and cared about me. And then I also found in that uh, falling in love period um, that really I was, again, just a sexual conquest. And so it wasn't very long before that was broken off. But we both needed people in our lives and so we couldn't afford not to have each other as friends. And so we developed a close relationship, friendship. And he uh, decided that he was going to go on vacation and ask me if I would stay and um, take care of his place while he was gone. And I said I would. And he says, you can help, help yourself to the drugs in the freezer. 
when I left the church, I, I threw everything away. I mean, what, what was the point? You know, I wanted to feel good now. So sex, drugs, rock and roll, that was me. I'd finished my work week. Friday had arrived, and I couldn't wait. Got my joint out, got my marijuana in it. I'm rolling a joint, go to the freezer, get the drugs out with angel dust, PCP, scraped it off into the joint, rolled it up, went to the living room, sat down, began to smoke it. Gone, blotto, out, like a light. When I started recognizing anything going on in my head, I was hallucinating and I was bouncing off of planets. And as I became more and more lucid, I found that I was laying in a fetal position on the floor. And the joint was on the carpet, and underneath the joint was a hole that was burned that was this big. The whole building could have burnt down. I would have been dead. Not only that, there was still this much of the joint left. If I finished the joint, I would be dead. And I went and I took it and to the back of the apartment and flushed it down the toilet. That was scary. And so I was hit with a huge burden of guilt. And I felt like I needed to do something. I, I felt that, that society and my parents and the church and all was somehow getting through that I was making wrong decisions. And so I did the unthinkable. I picked up the phone. I called the girl that I had been closest to. And I asked her to marry me. She said no. Life wasn't working out so well. I had no meaning. There was no purpose. So I moved back from San Francisco back into the Loma Linda area and went back to work at the hospital. Moved in next door to the girl that I had proposed marriage to. Um, Loma Linda University and patients at the, that time, as the patients would check out of the hospital, um, their, ta their uh, drugs that they had not used um, while they were inpatient were put conveniently at my desk in, an, out in a, um, uh, an outbox for the pharmacy to come by <clears throat> to pick up after they had been discharged from the hospital. So I began to create my own pharmacy at home uh, by taking those drugs home. And one day, one night, uh, when I was extremely depressed how um, the world was treating me and how things were not working out, I began to take um, a narcotic. And my next door neighbor, the girl I had proposed to, um, came around and she goes, you don't seem like you're quite all right. Have you been taking something? <clears throat> well, I knew she was on to me. So I went into the bathroom and I took the rest of the drugs fully intending to kill myself. And she called my boss from the hospital, and pretty soon I was getting a police escort um, to the hospital. And I vaguely remember the emergency room physician saying, we're going to pump your stomach. And it was nearly 24 hours later when I was in this three-bedroom, I mean this three-bed room in the hospital that I was the only man in the room. And there were these tinted windows in front of the bed when I woke up. And I looked out and I saw the bluest sky I have ever seen and this white puffy clouds that were floating by. And I cursed to myself and said I didn't make it. Uh, my parents came to see me. I told them I was gay. They already knew that. Which is generally the situation. Most gay people keep it a secret for as long as they can, but everybody's already figured it out before they decide they're coming out.
They told me that they loved me dearly and that God loves me and that they're not giving up on me and neither is God. And I went back to the lifestyle of the drugs and the men that I was pleasuring myself with. I decided I wanted to get away from everybody I knew. And so, <clears throat> where is the place that you can go and still be in the United States, but be as far away from everyone as you can possibly be? It's actually Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it is the last island off of Florida called Key West. And when you go to Hawaii, they generally put a lay around your neck and they might offer you a Mai Tai. If you land in Key West, they offer you a line of cocaine. And I took very well to that because it was the drug that felt good and made me happy. And so basically, and I didn't know this before I went to the island, but for two years... I was heavily addicted to cocaine. And interestingly there, I mean, you could put a line of cocaine out on a bar and people would use it. Even the, even the cops might come in and take a, a hit of it. But they, they were all into it. There wasn't anything. There were no drug busts. My room service manager uh, would say some mornings, ooh, you look like you've been partying. Uh, the bars there stayed open until 4.30 in the morning. I had to be to work at 7. You need a line, a hit. Uh, and so he would supply that. His manager in the hotel would supply him, even. That's how bad it was. And I decided that um, after two years, I better get off the island or I was going to lose my life there because it was becoming a very um, out-of-control habit. And so I moved to Seattle, Washington. Um, so you have... Peruvian pure cocaine here, and you have baby powder up here in Seattle, Washington. So there was no, I didn't have to worry about the drug habit being continued because there, was, there wasn't anything to it. It was cut so bad. But I wanted to get back to the people that were my friends in Key West, even though I'd moved that far away. I wanted to go visit, and I didn't have the money to do that, but I'd been told in my life that I'd always given this awesome massage and so I found in the papers that were circulating in Seattle and many other cities um, that there was a business that I could get into, a massage business, a stress-relieving, illicit massage business, better known as prostitution. And so for 12 years... I immersed myself into that line of work. And you're probably thinking that my clientele were gay men. Wrong. My clientele were heterosexual men. That's who I catered to. You see, by day, they were homophobic. And in the darkness of night, they would go through the papers and the online advertising. And in that darkness, they would go and they would live out their fantasies or their adventures. And it was clear to me that they were living the very lies that I openly professed. I lived a very gotcha life. And then they caught me. I was set up. I was arrested twice, convicted, and it's on my criminal history forever. Killer sex had arrived. AIDS. And my friends were dropping like flies. And I began to have a very ironic relationship with Jesus Christ. It went something like this. 
please, God, help this HIV test to come back negative, and I'll do something for you. Please. And so for 12 years, where I was having a combination of protected and unprotected sex, and many HIV tests, God spared my life. And my tests came back HIV negative time and time again, and I would just keep running back into what was pleasuring me, what was giving me any kind of reason for existence. I decided that um, perhaps I needed to move over into a different lane a more slowed down, tamed, calm life. And I was uh, blessed with parents who had taken us camping a lot when I was uh, younger. And so I did a, a web search for a gay campground. <laughs> and lo and behold, there was one. And I began to go to the campground, and I uh, met a guy there uh, named Dave and his dog Barney. And uh, his dog and I really got along real well together, and and uh, Dave and I would crack up. Dave would have these campfires, and he kept me laughing, and I loved to laugh. Um, I would come back every weekend. Dave would be there, and it turns out G uh, Dave was HIV positive and uh, on disability, and so he didn't work, and he just hung out there at the campground. And every time I'd come back, there was more decoration to his campsite, and it was just elaborate and crazy, and it was beginning to look like the Taj Mahal. And I said, Dave, how are you going to get all this stuff home at the end of camp season? And he goes, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. I said, well, I think I don't live too far away from you. I can probably help you. And so I put stuff in my car and he put stuff in his truck. And, and I really wanted to follow Barney because Barney had all my attentions, the dog. <laughs> and Dave had decided that when we got back to his place, uh, we started to become friends. And he said you know, why don't you take Barney? Because I can't take care of Barney the way um, I need to. He needs exercise. He loves to swim. Um, and so Barney came to live at my place. Uh, Barney was one of those really unique, individual, one-of-a-kind dogs. Um, he would make all kinds of noise if I'd get on the phone and talk to my parents until I would give the phone to Barney so that he could talk to my parents too. He was just really unusual, and I loved him. I would go and visit Dave, and Dave, Dave and I would go garage sailing on a regular basis, and, and I would get there, and before we would go garage sailing, he would say, whoa, 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 wait, uh, i got to have church. Huh? Church? Yeah. All right. I'd sit down. I'm like, oh, how long is this going to take? And he'd turn on the TV, and there would be this lady who was just nailing every biblical principle on the head. And she was making people fall in love with Jesus at the same time. And I thought, wow, if the Adventist church ever got a hold of this lady, this lady's incredible. Some of you might know that I'm talking about Joyce Meyer. And then Dave would turn off the TV and we'd go garage sailing. And, and so one day when that, uh, he turned off the TV and I said to Dave, I don't get this. How... Uh, you know, society doesn't want anything to do with you. Your parents really don't want anything. Nobody, your family, nobody approves of, of your life. How is it that you can maintain this relationship with Jesus Christ? And he said, Wayne, you can't let anything become, come between you and Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to put a, a judgment on Dave's life because I know that we can involve God in our lives and not necessarily do God's will, but God can take and use things to point people in different directions. 
And I don't know when Dave died what his relationship was like with Jesus Christ and what he had surrendered and, and what that looked like for sure. Only God and Dave know that. But I do know that from that very day that he told me that, that every morning I'd get up in the morning to go to work and I would get in the shower and I started praying to God. Never stop praying for the people that you love. That was five years before I gave my life to Jesus Christ. While you're praying and not thinking that God is hearing and answering your prayers, you're dreadfully wrong because God hears and answers all those prayers, but he doesn't force. He doesn't force and Satan doesn't force. God created us with the power of choice that we are in a position, if we will allow ourselves to be in a position in which we would listen to him, speak to our hearts, that we would respond as a result of those prayers and all of those angels and the Holy Spirit that have come around. And so one morning, I was sitting in my bedroom in front of my computer having one of those thought periods where you... You know, you kind of just sit down and, and you're trying to work everything out in your head. I was trying to figure out my destiny. I was trying to think about the future. I was trying to, I was caught up in the moment of the present, uh, 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 of where I was sitting. And, and I realized that every single one of my gay friends were dead. Who should have been dead? <laughs> and I seemed to hear God say to me, So, Wayne, can you hear me now? And God convicted my heart that I had spent my entire life trying to bring myself pleasure, pacifying myself, going about believing my feelings, trying to do everything that, um, that I wanted to do, but that I didn't really know Jesus because I hadn't spent time trying to get to know him. I hadn't, I hadn't spent time in his word. I hadn't spent time talking to him. I wasn't trying to figure out what his message to me or what his plan for me was because I'd made up my mind already about that. And I was impressed to look at the internet and do a Google search for the words Adventist and gay fully expecting that I would find one organization, SDA Kinship, who believes a monogamous same-sex relationship is honorable by God. And I had already been to uh, their meetings when I was 20 years old, and I found that they turned and twisted the words of God around so that they fit how they feel instead of what God's word is intended to say. I I, when I lived in the gay culture, I already was raised with truth. I knew what Jesus said, what, what, what his words said. The inspired writers had written to guide us and lead us. I knew all that. And so I couldn't be won over by SDA kinship, by the Metropolitan Community Church, or by any other religious organization who was going to try to make me feel okay with my feelings. That wasn't working for me. I knew better. And so I arrive at this website of an Adventist lady who had done Inga, uh, who had done some research and had spent a lot of time in her life the last, at that time, 12, 13, 14 years um, reaching out to gays and homosexuals. And 
there were four options that she had laid out um, in response to our gay feelings, my gay feelings. The first three were terminal. They ended with death. Only one life to live, according to self. And then I was puzzled by the fourth one. that said that God knew my feelings, he knew my loneliness, and that he still loved me, and that if I would give my life over to him to be in charge of and seek to know him, if I would surrender to him and if I would abide in him, that he would give me eternal life. And I looked up the word abide and I was like dumbfounded. Or some of you might say gobsmacked. Abide means to remain steadfast regardless of what your feelings are telling you. <laughs> oh, there was a huge clue. Because I had lived by my feelings. I made my life decisions were totally based on my feelings. They were my truth. But what happens if I come down there because of my feelings today, if I'm angry and upset at Pastor Ben and I want to strangle him and I start to strangle him because my feelings are telling me that it's my truth, why can't I live by my feelings? I think you get my point. Our feelings can tell us all kinds of things. But the facts were starting to have an impact on my life, and I found myself at the foot of my bed sobbing and saying, God, you know everywhere I've been. You know every dark alley. You know every sex club. You know every man that I've been with uh, in the sex trade. You know every needle that's been in my arm. You know my drug history. You know my alcohol history. You know I am nothing. Nothing. But you see value. Somehow you still see value in me. And your cross. And your life. And, and your ministry says that you lived and died for me and that the blood you shed for me is what I can claim for forgiveness of my sins. And I said, God, I'm going to claim it. But it is up to you. It is your responsibility, God, to reveal yourself to me because I don't know what to do next. And I got up and I went and I got in the shower and it was a Saturday morning. And I peeked out of the shower curtain and I looked at the clock on the wall and it said 1040 and there was an Adventist church two miles down the road. I grabbed the Bible that I had, that had packed around everywhere I went, that I hadn't opened for 35 years, that a friend had given to me. And I went to church, I walked in, and guess what? The roof didn't cave in. And I took a seat in the back pew. And I don't know what the topic of the sermon was that day, but I know that the pastor directed us to Philippians 4.13. And I opened my Bible that had not been opened for 35 years that my friend had given me. And at the top and the bottom of the page... On Philippians 4.13, it said, Wayne can do all things through Jesus Christ. Coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. And so the long and short of it is, is that I started going to church and um, I surrendered to Jesus and I met with the pastor and I told him, that I wanted to be baptized. And I began to realize that my life wasn't about um, going under the water gay and coming up straight. Isn't that what happened? No. <laughs> 
You see, it's not about sexual orientation. It's about an orientation to Jesus. There are two orientations. If you read through God's word, what, he, what, what, he developed, what I found when I read through, I didn't find sexual orientation in God's word. I found that either you're oriented to Jesus Christ or you're oriented to the world and what the world has to offer to you. And Jesus is my compass. And so today um, I live my life um, asking God to help me to fall in love with him more and more each day. I'm still growing. I am not safe for a moment without Jesus Christ. Um, I must abide in him. I must have a relationship with him. And the only way that relationship um, gets um, any kind of continuity to it is if I'm spending time with God, reading um, what he has given me to read, um, talking to him about what's going on in my life, um, about, um, about everything that concerns me, about sexual desires, um, about you know, finances, uh, about belonging, about loneliness, you know, whatever it is, because Jesus says that he will never leave us or forsake us. And in case you're not familiar with Philippians 4.13, what it really says is that uh, with Jesus Christ, anything is possible if we're living according to his plan, his will, um, that he will bring our life to, to a completeness in him. And today, my favorite verse, um, one of my favorite verses is Revelation 12, 11, where it says that we will overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony Amen. and by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. Today, it's not about me wanting to seek something that I can have only on this earth, a monogamous same-sex relationship, because that's where it ends, according to God's word. I want something that's going to last for eternity. I want Jesus. And so I've made my decision for him. And does that mean that I'm cursed to a sentence of celibacy? It's not a curse. We have come to believe that sexual behavior and sexual intimacy is a right rather than a gift. And what Genesis showed me is that God created a man and a woman and that he provided them with a gift of intimacy that was only be supposed to be between that man and that woman for, for their entire life. God may have someone in mind for me that he has yet to reveal and give to me. I only need to fall in love with, if it's his plan, one woman. He didn't ask me to fall in love with the entire female population. What if I went under the water gay and came up straight, and now I wanted to bed every woman in the church? You see, you see where the focus gets all out of sync? Do you see where expectation is dangerous for us to sit and look at somebody else's sin problem and say, well, what you really need is a good woman because you got it all planned out for me, right? But I would dare say that there are married couples in this room today that would tell me that marriage is not the antidote for sin. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. The opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. The opposite of any sin temptation is holiness. God loves you so deeply. And he wants you, he wants to claim you for eternity. And so I, I beg you, as he begs me to stop wasting time and to get to know him and find out what his will for you is because he will reveal himself to you, I promise, if you ask for it. But along the way, there's, uh, it, it, he hasn't asked me to just put sex aside. He's asked me to put some other things aside that um, were problems in my life. Um, and why did he choose me, who was so easily offended, to walk back into an environment where I was going to be criticized, where people, church leaders, would have skepticism about me and look and wait for me to fall so that they could say, you see, it doesn't work.
What if I fall? If I drop the soap, am I out of the shower? You see, God has grace. It's not cheap grace. It's not permission. It's not presumption that I go, okay, well, I'm feeling kind of, you know, frisky today, so I'm just going to go ahead and indulge, and I'll just do that because I know God's going to forgive me. And that's not that kind of mindset at all. It's saying that under, under the, the, um, the setting in this world where we are so often heavily hit with temptation, that if in a sense of being discouraged or whatever it may be, if I fell off the wagon, what are you going to do? Are you going to run from me? Are you going to run to me and lift me up? And pray for my brokenness. And say, dear Lord, I don't know what happened to this man, but he may be discouraged. He may be hurt. He may no longer feel that he belongs, that he matters, and that he's loved. But it's a lie. It's the lie of the enemy. Because you love him. You care about him. And it's only your love and your blood that's going to hold him together. And I lift him up to you. And James 5.16 tells us to confess our sins one to another and pray for the healing that is promised. Do we do that? No. Why would I confess my sins to somebody else? Because of gossip, right? They might go and talk to somebody about this. So what are we doing with that? So you have to come this afternoon and listen to my, my talk at uh, Ilam Church about engage. Is it all about homosexuality? I don't think so. This, this, is a, this is an eye-opening topic to get the scab off the surface to show that no matter what the sin temptation is, we need to rally around each other and love each other and care about one, one another and lift each other up to Jesus in prayer and grow into the community, into the real church family that God intended us to be. Let's get the focus off sexual orientation and put the focus on Jesus Christ and our identity in him. Big clue, in case you don't come this afternoon. Am I a gay Christian? Am I a same-sex attracted Christian? I mean, the list goes on. I won't even spend the time. Why would I identify myself by my temptation? When Paul was converted from killing Christians, did he become a Christian killing Christian? When an adulterer is converted and stops cheating on his wife and comes back and gives his life over to Jesus Christ, is he an adulterating Christian? When someone gives their pride over to Jesus Christ and becomes humble before Jesus and lives humbly in Christ, are they now a prideful Christian? Why would I identify myself by my past, what God redeemed me from, or by my temptation? Why wouldn't I identify myself by who he has given me the right to be, which is found in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that tells me that when I give myself over to Jesus Christ, that the past is forgotten. And that I am now what? Amen. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. And I'm clinging to it. That's who I am in Jesus today. And I will always identify by who I am in Jesus. Because if I, un- I identify with a label, that's like it's a disclaimer. Like the gay people are going to sit here and the adulterers there and the prideful here and the gossipers and the overeaters and so on and so forth and it's out of control. I don't have any special right to be here. I don't have any more right to be here than you do. Am I still tempted? My response today to that question is, are you Why would God take my temptations away and not take yours? Jesus was tempted. He was tempted in the Garden 
of Gethsemane. He was tempted on the cross. Sexual temptation is not a life-sustaining thing. Jesus was tempted in the desert after 40 days of no food with substance, something. Do you, do you think he might have been hungry? <laughs> he lived his life for us as an example. And so it's just the realization of all that stuff that just came flooding in and, 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 and that I have learned in my walk with Christ today that I'm sharing with you. It's what makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense with the whole rest of the world. But the whole world is not going to heaven. In the Bible, the majority in the Bible were never right. And the majority today is asking you to accept this as though it is natural and it shall always be. And guess what is natural? Sin is natural. We are born with a fallen nature. We will always be tempted with sin. What's unnatural is giving it over to Jesus Christ. And so that's my story. And if you want some more of, of uh, what I've discovered, um, come this afternoon. Um, but we did talk a little bit earlier about um, uh, you might have some questions. And I'm happy to answer um, anything that you ask um, just based on my experience. I don't have all the answers. Um, I do point to Jesus who does. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you might